Hello, uh, welcome everyone to the justice sessions. Uh, we're back. Uh, welcome to the University of North Florida and the spring, the opening uh, spring session of our justice sessions. I'm Keith Cartwright, chair of the Department of English, and we are delighted to be hosting the spring kickoff. The justice sessions are devoted to truth and justice, uh, as important uh, as ever to grapple with. And today, particularly to the paying of respect to Gullah Geechee culture, uh, a culture from right here on the first coast, stretching all the way up to North Carolina along the coast. I must say that I owe much of my career to uh, the tenacity and brilliant communities and humanity of Gullah Geechee uh, communities from this very space, uh, from my Peace Corps experience uh, with rice farmers in Senegal to dissertation work and first jobs in Brunswick, Georgia and Nassau, Bahamas on to being here in Jacksonville. Uh, Gullah Geechee culture has been a huge inspiration for me and uh, I'm delighted to be able to open today with our panelists. Um, so the US has two indigenous Creole languages and cultures. Um, many people, they're indigenous both to the African diaspora and to right here. Uh, in the U.S. Louisiana Creole is one, the other is Gullah or Geechee, native to this very space. Gullah Geechee language and culture developed all along the coast from North Carolina uh, to North Florida, and today we are going to hear from people from these communities who uh, know what they're talking about for sure. So that said, let me introduce our panelists. Um, Pleased to have Ms. Sandra Maureen, uh, president of Jacksonville Gullah Geechee Nation Community Development Corporation. She has served as a federal Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commissioner. And today, this corridor stretches 30 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean uh, and includes all the barrier islands from Wilmington, North Carolina to St. Augustine, Florida. She's a proud graduate of Florida A&M uh, and it's College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. And we are delighted to have her, to host her. She will also be leading a uh, session two weeks from today. So we are just beginning here. But also like to uh, welcome Ms. Agnolia Gay from Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, she is a master educator in the Little Rock School District, actress, poet, theater director, uh, leader of teacher workshops and event coordinator. Uh, I believe she worked previously in the Duval County school system. Did. Yes, I did. I did for about two years. Beautiful. Welcome back to Jacksonville, even if only virtually. Thank you. And thank you. And I also would like to welcome Dr. Veronica Gerald. Uh, she was founding director of the Charles Joyner Institute for Gala and African Diaspora Studies at Coastal Carolina University, just up the coast a little bit. She has been Patricia Roberts Harris Fellow at Emory University, Chancellor Research Fellow at USC, Coastal Carolina. And uh, we are absolutely delighted to have the three of you leading this session. I am going to turn it over to the experts and thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, the Gullah Geechee people are descendants of Africans, tribal groups, including Native Americans. They were enslaved on tobacco, rice, agricultural, indigo, and sea island cotton plantations of the lower Atlantic. Many came from the rice corn growing region of West Africa, the Caribbean island and South America. The knowledge that we have on mankind's existence and life gives credence to the travel many, many years ago. Wow. Today we present Pathway to a People series. It is divided up into two parts, part one and part two, we are specifically 
today looking at the evolution of Gullah and Geechee and how Gullah and Geechee reached Florida. The knowledge of how mankind's existence life gives credence to the ease of travel many, many years ago. It began 255 to 280 million years. And during that time, we have evidence of a super continent, which over time changed. The Palazzo, the eras that um, constituted these seven continents that uh, emerged. And God, North America continues with Africa, South America, and Europe. They all extended as a single planet. And the explanation of this major supercontinent which is a great way for us to begin the model of how we will start this lesson. And God stepped out on space and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. Then God smiled and the lightning broke and the darkness rolled up on one side and the light stood shining on the other and God said, that's good. And that good. I yet you to talk about creation it put me in the mind of my full-time great grandma Bina. They say she been ticked right out of the yard. Right out of the yard. He ain't been but nine years old. And mama been sent him out to play. And then a Yeti, somebody to scream and Bina been calling mama. Some man grab him and put some sack on top of his head. And she called mama, mama. And all the mama could get it, Bina talk, and Bina can get it, mama said, Bina, Bina. And all they talk and scream at each other, they can't get to each other, and Bina get farther and farther and find a way. And the way the story go, they take she and put she on top some thing that ride pun water. And the next time you know, it come to some place that have tree that have some white thing been hanged from them. And that's all she can remember about what had happened when he leave his mama. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's going to trouble. The, the lesson today. I come today to tell you the story of a long, dark way that I had to climb, that I had to know in order that the race might live and grow. Look at my face, dark as the night, yet shining like the sun with love's true light. I am the dark girl that crossed the Red Sea, carrying in my body the seed of the free. I am the one who worked as a slave, beaten and mistreated for the work that I gave. Children sold away from me, husbands sold truth, no love, no honor, no respect. Was I do. Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous country after Asia. In both cases, it has 30 million point three plus kilometers, including adjacent islands. It covers 6% of the Earth's total surface. 
area of about 20% of land with 1.3 billion people as of 2018. We know that at that time, Africa supplied labor worldwide, being the second largest continent and the most populous with a great amount of natural resources. These slides show how Africa and the resources from Africa were maintained. They, this also shows how the transatlantic slave trade was formed and all of the societies that formed within the Atlantic Ocean with transatlantic Creoles, how Africa supplied slavery west, but before that, slavery went east. Large amounts of enslaved individuals went to South Carolina and sugar factories and sugar foundries, the Caribbean, and then on to North America. In North America, what we found is that the 30 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean, which we know now today as the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, and all of the 80 barrier islands that span from Wilmington, North Carolina to St. Augustine, Florida, the isolation of that area caused for a new language, which was the culminating language of all of the countries of Africa and the over 200 languages spoken, the countries of Portugal, Spain, England, Ireland. These 80 barrier islands were home to rice, indigo, cotton, tobacco, agriculture, And what we know now today is the supplier for most of the world, the slaves. See that what been happened. Stephen, being it been take out a yard, being it been part of that whole thing to bring them over here for start the crop. And in being a case, all he people know about rice. He know how to grow them, know how to harvest them. And Lord know they know how to cook them. So when Bina come at nine years old, they have a child that can give them children and work. And that will happen with that bringing over. It been a lot of them. I hear people say people all over the continent of Africa been missed their children, but they ain't know where they go. But when we look at these place, like uh, what you to talk about on the coastline, all them people, to include my four-time great-grandmama, been part and parcel of this pathway you to talk about. So what we found was that in many of the colonies, as, as slavery progressed, there were roads, King's Highway, the Fall Line Road, the Upper Road, the Great Valley Road, that were born out of footpaths of Native Americans. And as plantation industry increased and went further and further away from the, the Atlantic Ocean, they formed new communities and new lands. And all them places like where you where honey live in Florida, all them place been take up. That's St. John River and all that. See down here in the Carolina colony, they have Brook Green. Brook Green, by the time they get to the Civil War, Brook Green done furnished 40% of all the rice been furnished in the world. That been on the back of we people. So the pathway that you to talk about been one that start with one thing and end up with another. And that's how we've been look at it from all these times, how you start one way and the people then make a life for themselves in another way. We raise the wheat. They give us the corn. We bake the bread. 
they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the husk. We peel the meat, they give us the skin. And that's the way they take us in. The time period of the settlement around the United States and specific areas that gave common pattern to larger cities like Jacksonville. And what we see as the bold new city of the South, most enslaved people after the Civil War called it Magic City. The reason is that Magic City allowed work for the enslaved and the history of mitigation and genealogy moves forward. Jacksonville Gullah Geechee are descendants of people that were enslaved Native Americans and Africans from North, West and Central Africa who maintained their geographical, through geographical isolation, many of their customs, dialects and languages. This map shows that Jacksonville, Florida is home to 245,000 to 750,000 Gullah Geechee descendants in a combined statistical area of 1.6 million people. This map shows the areas of occupation of today along the St. John's River that has many unrestricted zoning areas which call for a lot of the problems that we see health-wise, socioeconomically. And we look forward to making the change. I think, uh, Sandra, if I may, we need to, you need to share uh, your screen. I, uh, we're not seeing the map. Oh. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay. Oh, just wow. Hit the, just hit the mouse and the mouse. Just hit the mouse? Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor spans from Wilmington, North Carolina, as we've said, to St. Augustine, Florida, some 80 barrier islands, uh, the population growth in the four states, approximately 50 million people, 5 million of which are Gullah Geechee descendants that actually live today in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Slavery in the United that would been happen. That would been happened. They get together and they didn't they look like each other, but they ain't talk like each other. So they have to make a way to talk like each other. All that to happen in a big group you've been talked about. Slavery in the United States and the Gullah Geechee cultural heritage have the same origin of existence. However, Gullah Geechee customs have had many Native American influences. My missus promised me that when she died, she was going to set me free. She lived so long that her head got bald. She gave out the notion of dying at all. Massa likewise promised me, Sambo is going to set you free. But Massa go and make his will to leave me a plow and old back steel. The Tamaku are native to the Jacksonville area, as we have evidence in the Timaquan Ecological Preserves. The Native American and slave population. Native Americans dwindled in population as the enslaved population grew. Trade of 1621 from the Dutch West Indian Company was chartered by a group of Dutch merchants in 1621. It modeled a better known Dutch East Indian Company. The trade monopoly included West Africa between the Tropic of Cancer and the Cape of Good Hope. 
all coming to a newly conquered world. Its merchants traded slaves, gold, ivory in Africa, mostly on the Gold Coast, now Ghana. The new world was an expansive term and meant virtually anywhere not covered by the Dutch East India Company monopoly. New Amsterdam, for example, included not only present-day New York, but also Connecticut, New Jersey, and Delaware. Native Americans and enslaved populations explained fully on these slides, which you can refer back to, show that in 1619, Juan Batista entered the colony of Virginia over 400 years ago. King Charles was able to gain his throne and reign in 1685 by the help of the lords of proprietors who were then able to bring their plantation industry from the Caribbean up into North America. Fort Caroline, Jacksonville, Florida, has over 450 years of history in Duval County. The spread of slavery from 1820 to 1870. Well, them people began uh, to look around at each other and want their freedom and, and, and want to find a way to get it. And most people have been talking about the Gullah people been going now, but they ain't been talked about the one that come down there where Anna they live. So you had the people from the Carolina that go down the go down there where Hunter to live, and then another mix take place, another language take place, more things that they did and thought take place. So every time there was a movement on that pathway, and we find out each other, Gullah Geechee get bigger and bigger. We is gathered here, my brothers and sisters, in this howling wilderness for to speak some words of comfort to each other in distress. And we'll choose this for our subject. This will explain it by and by when the Lord said, Moses, Moses, and the man said, here am I. Now Pharaoh down in Egypt, he was the worst man ever born. And he had them Hebrew children down there working in his cone. To the Lord, he got tired of his fooling. Says he, I let him know, look here, Moses. Go tell Pharaoh for to let them children go. For if he refuses to do it, I'll make him rule the hour. For I'll cast down on Egypt all the vows of my power. Yes, he did. Because Pharaoh's army wasn't worth a half a dime. The Lord will help his children. You can trust him every time. And your enemies may sell you in the back and in the front. But the Lord is all around you. For the bad, your battles brunt. They can fold your chains and shackles from the mountains to the seas. But the Lord will send some Moses for the set is still and free. We have here before you a slave map of 1860. It shows the density of slavery and how it is moved from east to west. And many of those communities that were born out of slavery are still intact and relatively completely intact today. As a Pathway to a People series, part two, we want to give you the amount of information that's necessary for you to think back from the transatlantic slave trade and United States slavery, the number of slave ship routes, the number of, uh, of people that were taken out of a 12 million square mile Africa and brought over to continents that they do nothing about. Reformed, survived, lived, and are today a part of the United States of America. The 1860 slave density map shows how many slaves were on the United States shores and how many of those slaves were freed. The thing about that slavery, the way you to talk about, it worked in a bad way, but then it worked in a good way because 
all them people been close in the Carolina colony, they've been more African than anybody else. They always ask when they get off the boat, plenty of people say, this look like Africa. So the more we stay together and blend together, we get strong. And so the pathway that we to walk on gets strong. They had a great big party down the Tom's the other night. Was I there? You bet. I never in my life see such a sad. All the folk from four plantations was invited, and they come. They come trooping thick as chillings when they hear the fife and drum. Everybody was dressed they finest. Hush your mouth and get away. Ain't seen no such fancy dressing since last quarterly meeting day. Gals all drax and sickles and satins, not a wrinkle nor a crease. Eyes are bad and teeth are shining. Hair brushed back as slick as grease. Scuts all tucked and puffed and ruffled. Every blessed seam and stitch. If you would have seen them with their missus, couldn't have swear to which was which. Mandy Lyle, y'all must excuse me. There wasn't much upon my chef. Now I tried my best to suit you, so sit down and help yourselves. Tom, he lied. I don't believe in apologizing and professing. Let them take it like they catch it. Elder Nichols, will you ask the blessing? Wish you'd see that colored preacher clear stolen by his head. When I shut and when I open, this is every word he said. Lord, look down and turn the muscle on such generous hearts as these makes us truly thankful. Amen. Pass that possum if you please. Well, we laughed and carried on till there wasn't nothing left. We felt just like new sausage. We was most not stuffed to death. Tom, he chewed the fiddle, put some rossum on the bowl, set a pine box on the table, mounted it. And let her go, he's a fiddler now. I tell you, and he made the fiddle ring to the oldest and the lamest had to get their feet at flame. And the Christians and the sinners got so mixed up on the floor that I doubt the day departed if the trumpet chanced to blow. You ought to have been there at the party. Everything was rich and prime. I can't tell you nothing about it. We just had a scrumptious time. Today, the culture and this just linguistic umbrella of the Gullah and Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor extends throughout the four states. People who identify as Gullah and Geechee represent in many ways Native Americans and Africans in the Americas and move forward. The Gullah Geechee framework and expression in Jacksonville has moved from the ordinary expected Gullah and Geechee to an expression that actually moves from kings and queens in Africa to the interpretation today of Jacksonville, Florida. Gullah Geechee communities have transformed this expression of cultural heritage into interpretation and reinterpretation, reflecting research and development through creative artistical design presentations by Frederica Mendel. Mendez, Gullah Geechee people have retained many aspects of their African heritage due to those geographical barriers, a strong sense of place and family of Gullah Geechee community members. Pathway to community management has come to Jacksonville in many ways and for many years. A newly formed identity with the community of Cosmo came out of an attempt to bring the communities together of Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. These signs of community have been placed throughout the city of Jacksonville. And here you see the Gullah Geechee cultural heritage quarter management commission and a group of student leaders who gave their thoughts on where we were at that time and where we should be 10 years later. Men whose boast it is that ye come of fathers brave and free. If there breathe on earth a slave, are ye truly free and brave? If ye do not feel the chain when it works a brother's pain, are ye not base slaves indeed? Slaves unworthy to be freed. Women, 
who shall one day bear sons to breathe New England's air, if ye hear without a blush, deeds that make the ruse blood rush like red lava through your veins for your sisters. Now in chains answer, are you fit to be mothers of the brave and free? Is true freedom but to break fetters for our own dear sake and with leathern hearts forget we owe mankind to death? No. True freedom is to share all the chains our brothers wear and with hand and heart to be earnest to make others free. Fruit Cove, Cosmo, Middleburg, Schools for Blacks. Only officially given after emancipation. Long before that, communities were born and are still alive based on oral histories and in vivo learning of communities from one generation to another. How we were taught, how we were brought into existence and how we survived were all taught by generations of people who came before us and imparted that wisdom. As you we may You may write me down in history. With your bitter, twisted lies, you may trod me in the very dirt, but did still like dust I rise. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tide, just like hopes springing high still, I'll rise. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I rise. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling. I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a day that's wondrously clear, I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And that been the story about the Pat Wait. When my full-time great-grandmama Bina been come over, like you say, been take from everything he know. But when he didn't come over and get with them other people from them other groups, it grow and they rise. And that pathway that we had talked about, it had two stories. One story was slavery and enslavement, but the other story was about the rise. And that was honor to see in Jacksonville, a big city with people that rise just like it been be, been due long time ago, rise. American history of slavery began long before Jamestown. The arrival of the first captives to Jamestown colony in 1619 and the beginning of slavery in America. But the enslaved arrived in North America as early as 1500s. It's believed that the first of Africans was brought to the colony of Virginia 400 years ago this month. The year of the return, 2019 to 2020, is where baskets, delegations went over and actually Dr. Gerald was part of this delegation that went over and they sewed baskets from South Carolina and also sewed the same baskets in Africa. Jacksonville, Florida's year of expression, the year of 2020 has shown us that we truly embrace the African culture as we look forward to a future of justice and inclusion. Go lay down my burdens, down 
by the riverside. I'm going to lay them down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Going to lay down my burdens. Down by the riverside to study war no more. The transatlantic slave trade was a massive production. It took many countries outside of the United States that we know today to take part in that triangular trade. It not only embraced the culture that we see today in the Gullah Geechee Culture Heritage Corridor. South America was affected. The Caribbean was affected. Native Americans with such things as the Trail of Tears or the Long Walk were affected. And even the country of Africa dwindled with the knowledge, the base of that knowledge for the descendants. The year of the return was a year that we tried to take things back to Africa and inform them that we in America appreciated our roots. I am the darker brother. I am the darker sister. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I lie. Eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes and nobody will dare say, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I am the darker brother. I am the darker sister. I too sing America. As we know, slavery in the United States began long before the American Revolutionary War of 1776, starting as early as the 1400s and legally ending in 1866 in the United States of America we saw a plantation industry that was second to none on any other planet. The gross domestic product of the United States, newly formed United States of America after the American Revolution is a few things that fueled the economy that we see today. As being part of the Gullah Geechee culture heritage, we now have learned to celebrate that heritage and we celebrate it in festivals. We celebrate it in costume. We celebrate it as children who have survived. The traditional cultural heritage of yesteryear is reenacted by seniors of this year to show the importance of that culture and how we made it over. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee, lest our hearts Drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to our God, true to our native land, Africa. Our comfort was in foods. We took the scraps and made them delicious. We took the fowl from the air, the fish from the sea, the berries from the vine. We made a pleasant and transforming history come alive. The folklore that we now celebrate takes us back to Africa and brings us forward in ancestral marches that we have at each of our October Gullah Fest festivals. 
the celebration not only extends from Jacksonville, but it also extends up and down the quarter, the language, the song, the dance. We want to instill in our young so that they will realize that the Gullah Geechee of Jacksonville, Florida can interpret cultural heritage and that we enjoy where we came from and that we are pushed to teach that enjoyment as we move from slavery to freedom, as we move from state to state, as we move from the plantations to the communities that are in the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, Duval County area. We have suggested that we move through education, inspiration, development, and preservation of this culture. Jacksonville Gullah Geechee's mission is that of inspiration. Thank you for your attendance as we build communities and bridges and bridge gaps of Gullah Geechee barriers within our newly formed communities. Sandra, if I may, may I share one more piece? Sure. They tell us to forget the Golgotha we tread. We who are discouraged with hate a price upon our head, they who have shackled us, require of us a song, they who have wasted us, bid us overlook the wrong. Oh, how can we forget our human rights denied? Oh, how can we forget our manhood crucified when justice is profane and plea with curse is met when freedom gates are barred? Oh, how can we forget? And for me, that's what this pathway to a people that Sandra has so eloquently put together is about. It's about us not forgetting. How can we forget? We will not. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> And thank you so much for this inspiring and formative and passionate presentation. Um, beautiful and powerful. Invite the audience to submit questions through the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. And I will uh, field the questions for the, to, for the presenters. Um, one thing I would ask is the power of, well, the pressures and uh, the economies of forgetting as they appear in our public school systems uh, can, can be tough. What, it takes incredible work to push against that forgetting and this is the work you're doing. I'm wondering uh, what work is being done in the public schools uh, up and down the corridor. And certainly we want to align ourselves more with that work. But what are your own uh, perspectives on how, the, how our public schools stand in addressing Gullah Geechee Nation within the corridor? One of the things I'd like to say to that is that, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. it, the, the image of the Gullah Geechee people that was set forth outside of the culture, the way that people began to interpret us, it was so strong that when you try to educate, it is difficult because you're fighting against an image that's solid. The Gullah Geechee person in the world of the outsider 
can only do certain things like sing, dance, shout, read. The totality of the culture itself is not presented. People, no matter how much you ask and how much you educate it, educate, the only thing they're interested in is the language. So my answer to that is it's still an uphill battle. I'd also like to add as an educator in the, um, in the secondary schools, um, my struggle is what is um, documented in the textbook. And until we um, correct that documentation in the textbooks, um, and until we find those educators that are bold enough to tell our truths, everybody can't tell the truth. So those teachers who all they're depending on is the textbook uh, would give you just a snippet, you know, of, of, of our reality. Um, and so that is, I guess, one of the reasons that uh, history month is so important. Um, even though we understand it's 365 days of black history, um, that's the reality. But to uh, allow um, people of the African diaspora to tell their story, to implement it, because in reality, the students are not getting it in the classroom. They're not getting um, the transparent uh, truth of the story of our people. And of course, that's my personal opinion. Well, I think that basically the, um, the view that we have had of slavery um, and when we began to talk about Gullah Geechee culture and history has uh, been born out of uh, the basic view and paradigms that people have for slavery. The harshness of slavery has always been implemented into the minds of everyone as being uh, a harshness that a people was worthy of. But in order to tell that entire story, you've got to be able to reach in and be able to inform and have good information showing the importance of that labor for the United States of America. And then not only that, the beauty of the culture as it is today and as we should look at yesterday. Thank you. Uh, and you know, I know that uh, some of the plantation heritage tourism is a big part of the problem too. Uh, in, but uh, we've got a question from Amanda Evans uh, from Wilmington, North Carolina, on the other side of the corridor. She <laughs> thanks you for this wonderful presentation. And she asks, how would you recommend educators find resources? What would you like to see happen as far as teacher training about this important heritage so that we can bring it to our elementary, middle, and high school students? She says, as a white parent living in the Southeast, as someone not part of the Gullah Geechee, I am personally committed to my children and all children learning correctly about this rich heritage, but I feel it isn't present enough in our educational resources. And she agrees the textbooks are horrid. Uh, so what are your thoughts then on teacher training and uh, resources for educators? Well, in South Carolina, we have um, a teacher institute offered through the African American History Commission, which is comes out of the governor's office. And they start by bringing the teachers in and teaching the teachers. And that seemed to work. But one thing that worked for me um, when I was at the Penn Center was having the teachers identify the students in their classes and then have the students as an assignment interview the oldest people in their family. And once they start seeing that that's important to interview people in their families, it tends to strengthen their desire to 
want to know more about the culture because grandma is in it or uncle Jack is in it. So I would suggest that um, starting first with those around you, interview them, make it informal, start very flexible because a lot of times the people that you're interviewing are not necessarily aware of their association to the culture. Mm -hmm. So I think going inside out is the best way to do it for education. So the textbook, that's not going to be of any use because as I said, the kind of images that they present of the Gullah Geechee people will be what you will find in the textbook. Mm -hmm. It's not going to go further than that. Mm -hmm. So um, having the children on the job training, mm -hmm. on the job learning is really a very good way to do that. To start it, at least. And I would also add, absolutely, I would also add to invite those, once they identify those elders, those are your guest speakers. Those are the ones you want to invite to the table. You, uh, We're not face-to-face -face right now, so this makes it even easier. If they can show them how to get on that computer, then they can um, give answers some of those questions and they can talk about, mm -hmm. tell some stories. See, there are so many stories that are not being told uh, and we'll never get them because we don't even ask the questions. So mm -hmm. once you identify who those elders are and start asking them questions, then uh, they got a lot of stories to tell and a lot of information and wisdom that's worth knowing. But yes, it is important for us as not, um, educators to, um, to create those engaging activities, um, like Dr. Gerald just said, for our students. You know, sometimes we got to get away from that textbook and we got to, you know, just start um, being creative about um, making sure that we implement lessons um, that are worthy, uh, that connect to, to content such as the Gullah Geechee uh, heritage because that's not in any textbook. I've been teaching 23 and a half years and it wasn't in any textbook that I came across. So one of the things that I will mention is that for the most part, for the greater part of the Gullah Geechee uh, research and history, the National Park Service was given the uh, reins in, in order for them to study the Gullah Geechee. So National Park Service on their website has several uh, lessons and modules for plantation life, for learning about Gullah Geechee, for developing new skills in oral history. Those uh, those uh, lessons have not been uh, actually distributed well, even though the United States did pay for the National Park Service to do that information. If you were to uh, uh, ask the National Park Service for copies of them, they would tell you to go to the website, which is not always as good as it should be to maneuver, but educators could definitely go in and learn a lot about Gullah Geechee, African-American history that moves earlier than the Civil War and after the Civil War on into the Civil Rights Movement. So we have to be deliberate on how we um, take that information and transpose it into our children's lives today because most of them are oblivious to uh, the actual culture and heritage and the beauty of it. And I want to add to that um, that it all stops. It's, that, it's as though this culture stops at a certain time period. You said the civil rights movement. Um, somehow it has to be instilled in the minds of educators and parents that cultures don't stop. They evolve, they adapt, they become sort of like what we were saying about being on the pathway when these people were on this pathway, they evolved. They edited as they went along. Most of us are bilingual. We can speak standard English and Gullah. There are not a lot of bilingual people in this country as good 
as uh, God speakers are. So basically that will not enter into the conversation because according to a lot of that which has been published, the culture stops in the civil rights movement. So it doesn't include you, me, Sandra, <laughs> or Agnolia because we are post that. So what we are doing is not a part of the, the, the conversation. And then also the expectation is to change the language. So the language, um, the Gullah language, now you want to force individuals to use standard English. That's the expectation. Yes. You know, and so people who use the language are looked down on, you know. But they're not and, called bilingual. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So now we understand, thank you, Dr. Gerald, we understand that when, you know, a, a culture of people are speaking their language, understand that it allows, it makes them more uh, useful because they are bilingual. And we understand that when you're bilingual, <laughs> you're more important yeah. and more useful. Is there, we could be an interpreter, especially for some of the older Gullah speakers. Yes. <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to, to mention is that uh, even today, when we're teaching children to read, we, we may not think that we speak Gullah, but of course, when they're learning the THs in Gullah, the TH is D. I learned that just about a year ago with my twin granddaughters, they are used to hearing us say that, but when they are looking at the word, they see that and they had to learn what that meant because we don't say that we say that <laughs> so basically the bilingual household that we have it's not a recognized language <laughs> as a bilingual household <laughs> well it is because we know now that the th does not exist in our heritage language heritage so anything with TH in the beginning of the word or TH at the end of the word is going to be changed to D. Or if it's like a word like with, it becomes with, with an F. Are you going with me? So all of that is realized by us, but at home we often will spank the kids on the hand and say no, instead of encouraging and letting them know Bilingualism is okay. Thank you. I would. We've got a bunch of questions, and we're not going to have time to get to all of them. Fortunately, we've got a two weeks from today another session on Gullah Geechee Nation. I would like to end with one last question from one of our alums, who's uh, working in uh, the Museum of Science and History in Jacksonville, and is asking a, a question about curation. She says, uh, I'm an alum of UNF, this is from Jasmine Turner, an alum of UNF English and History Departments, a uh, former park ranger, who's currently the volunteer coordinator at the Museum of Science and History in Jacksonville. As this museum, MOSH, begins to plan for the new museum in downtown Jacksonville, how can we include Gullah Geechee voices? What would you like, what would you like us to challenge ourselves to commit to as a museum staff? Uh, in my opinion, I think you should uh, include uh, a section of museum called uh, the Museum Component of Gullah Geechee Art and History. And basically with that, we can move from one, uh, from the beginning to present. Um, the, the presentation that I tried to put together today showed an evolution. And I'm going to leave you with that so that you can see that here in Jacksonville, Gullah and Geechee still exist. And the evolution is so embedded into a diverse community that it is included, but yet not recognized. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the panelists for uh, presenting today. It's uh, this has been an incredibly spirited and rich uh, session. Uh, I'm deeply appreciative that you've shared uh, 
your knowledge and your passion with us here in Jacksonville uh, from Arkansas, South Carolina, and right here. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to say thank you uh, to Sandra for um, inviting me to be a part of this absolutely awesome presentation and definitely want to encourage um, all of the individuals interested to reach out to Sandra because I've been uh, performing with her Gullah Festival for the past six or seven years. I was living in, um, in Jacksonville for just a couple, three years, and I met her and the information that she has shared with me, uh, African-American woman, I'm telling you, um, it was so important and I've shared it with my family. So definitely reach out to um, Sandra. She's in the area and she too, for me, has been rendered invisible and she is such a powerful resource. So definitely you want to, to reach out to her and, and that is the starting point for me to reach out to Sandra Marine and um, you're on your way to doing and having everything that you need to know about this Gullah Geechee pathway to a people. Absolutely. And this is why she's uh, hosting this and why we are inviting her back to host again in two weeks to build these connections, to, to see the richness we have and to put everybody in contact with the people that can help us uh, learn and represent the heritage in Jacksonville and beyond. So thank you. We'll be back in two weeks with Sandra Maureen once again. Please everyone come back and join us. And thanks to our special guests from the heart. Thank you. Thank you.